You are now listening to the Minority Trailblazer Podcast. Let the story begin. One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin. Hold me down. Damn. Welcome to the Minority Trouble is a podcast, and I'm your host, Greg ELV. Culture change agent. You already know on this show we interview young, successful minorities in a variety of fields to educate, empower, and inspire our current and future generation leaders. And yo, we here. And the show is exciting. And the show is less than an hour. So stand up. Get excited. We ain't had a show less than an hour since season one. And not only is it less than an hour, it's jam-packed with good information, good stories, and it's just overall a pleasant interview. And I'm interviewing my home girl who is doing some phenomenal work in Dallas, Texas with her magazine. I'm going to be fully transparent. Typically, I've done close to 10 magazine interviews in my life. It's typically the magazines that, A, never see the light of day, never get published, or when they are published, it's on a bad, bad, poorly designed website, or if imprint, stuff is inaccurate, stuff is not spelled right, and I just I haven't had a good uh, track record with publications. Like, I guess I ain't, I ain't big time yet, so I ain't getting the big boy publications, but the up-and-comers, the startups, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit weary of doing interviews uh, with certain magazines, and She had reached out like a year, year and a half ago to do an interview, doing a piece. And I really didn't know what to expect. Of course, she was professional on the phone, had articulated a really great plan. But you never know. So I did an interview, sent over my headshots, and I I let the Lord work with it. Around like a year ago, not a year, like six or seven months ago, I get a package in the mail with my name on it. So I open the package and I see this magazine. Mind you, this this is I I've forgotten about the magazine or doing the interview. And I'm looking at the magazine, I'm like, yo, this looks like something I could like see in the dentist's office or at the grocery store. Had some high fashion type stuff on the front cover, had a lot of different stories inside of it. And then I look I like page 17, I see my face. I'm like, hold up, this the magazine I'm in? Like it don't have nothing about motivational speaking, no about nothing about education. It just had different stories and different different layouts and different fronts. And I was like, yo, this is phenomenal. And I immediately said, I got to have her on a podcast because the work that she's done in a field that some would say is dying and just the effort and amount of sure will that comes together, putting together a full magazine in, in less than six months. So I said, let me let me get her on this podcast to share her story, share everything about that process and let me just profile her before she really blow up into the whole nother level. So let me get it right when she first started. And I know the audience is going to be able to get something from it because anybody right now is working on a big project, maybe a project in your head saying, yo, I don't even know if I can even do this. If I'm cut for it, people keep telling you no, people keep dropping you out, all this other stuff. You can learn something from this interview. And for those of you that are successful, just love hearing stories, you can learn something from this interview as well. And overall, this is just a great Short and sweet. And I know you're like, yo, I, short and sweet is 10 minutes, you know. Hours still a long time. But bear with me, bear with me, bear with me, all right? I'm going to read her bio, and then we're going to jump into the show. So, she is a journalist, entrepreneur, and lifelong student who's passionate about storytelling, style, and connecting with other happy humans. In 2015, she started Fashion4.com, a production company that specializes in makeup, artistry, photography, styling, and model development. And in 2017, she launched Ford Magazine. This biannual publication is dedicated to providing exposure for freelance models while having authentic discussions about issues they believe everyone cares about. She's also a journalism teacher at North Garland High School, where she teaches intro to journalism and advises the newspaper, yearbook, and broadcast staff. She is an SMU alum, and she is currently 
working her way through getting her master's degree in business. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Micah Williamson to the Minority Troublemaker podcast. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello, Greg. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. I'm ready to dive right on in. Oh, uh, say less, say less, say less, say less. So um, as a, as a show, we always try to start the show off with a quote just to get the vibes rolling, just to kind of weigh into the story. So, Micah, could you give our audience a quote and a story about how you apply that quote to your everyday life? So I'm, I'm big on words. Um, I'm a journalist. So naturally, I just love words. So I have a wall of quotes mm-hmm. in my Um, And one in particular um, from Henry Ford. And it's if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And I just I love that quote so much because sometimes I feel like people have these ideas that people don't understand. And it's like, you know what? You're not going to get it until you see it. Um, And so that's why I love that quote so much. Mm, so when's the last time you had an idea that most people didn't understand outside of kind of like, don't, 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 don't get into the podcast oh, just yet, no. <laughs> but like, but like, like pre pre magazine world, an idea that you, that people didn't understand, but you, but you stood by it and you applied that quote. Ooh, um, man, that's a hard one because I do want to dive right into the magazine, but you know what? I, I guess I would have to say, um, when I pursue journalism, um, like every time I would like tell people, people would always talk to me like, you know what, you're, you're very articulate young lady. Da, da, da. And then they start asking me all these questions and then they say, so what are you studying in school? And I say journalism and they would give me like this weird look, like, <laughs> why are you doing that? Like, you know, newspapers are dying, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I was, you know, I always have to explain to people, you know, we still need information. We still need facts. I know it seems kind of weird. You guys think that, uh, there's a certain aspect of journalism that's dying, but, you know, journalism is going to be such a thriving industry. And I feel like there are going to be so many different ways that people are going to, you know, share information and share facts and connect with each other. Um, and so I think that might have been one of those things. I kind of just took this leap. I thought I was going to go to school to study marketing, Greg. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember they told me that I had to do um, some class like my 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 first year. And I was like, oh, no, I did not want to do this. And I met this lady. She was a producer from CBS. Wow. Um, and we started talking. And I told her, I was like, you know what? I feel like I need to be wherever you are. <laughs> she started talking to me and I told her that I was going to study marketing. And she was like, uh, yeah, you need to go talk to your advisor right now <laughs> and tell her that you need to change your major. She was like, because just looking at you and listening to you talk, I can already tell you like this is where you need to be. Um, and so I just kind of took that leap. Um, and so far, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. <laughs> yeah, man, that's great. And matter of fact, we are just going to jump right into it. Usually I typically warm it up and have a lateral way, but if, it, if the vibe is feeling, we can go ahead and jump right into it. But before we do, I did want to ask you this question, being a journalist, especially now being in where we live in an online society where everybody typically has an opinion on certain things. A lot of people have um, their own channels, their own blogs, their own mediums, their own kind of networks in a say. What is, what do you think, what is your take from a journalist perspective? Um, how things are rocking out because sometimes people may not have all the facts or maybe misinterpreting wrong facts and everybody can and of course it's free 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 america everybody can have their opinion but have you seen now a lot of news gets carried this false a lot of things get shown and at times it can be very very detrimental to the society mm-hmm. specifically a black culture so uh what would you say what's your take right now on uh journalism and then people having their own like own networks and saying what they want I think it's important for, you know, people to share their opinions. You know, I love hearing people, you know, who have different perspectives from myself. But what I do think starts to become dangerous is whenever we disagree on facts. Mm. Like the sky is blue. Like we understand that, you know. And then it's when people start to distort facts is where we it gets really dangerous, you know. Um, but I do, I mean, I definitely think, you know, freedom of expression is important. You know, I think people should have their own, you know, take on certain things like, you know, our government and, you know, and certain things, but I definitely think we should not, we cannot discredit facts. You know, what's true is true. (laughs) But now we live in a, we have the president of the United States and, and and some things that, yeah, alternative facts and everything else. And (laughs) there's no such thing. You know, it's either it's either true or it's not true. And even in journalism, when you see, you know, you'll have an op ed piece and it's labeled an op ed piece. You know, it ha- you have to let people know, like, this is just my opinion. 
I'm in no way stating that this is fact. And I think it's just important for us to make sure, you know, there's a distinction between the two because we have people that, you know, there are some people that know how to vet certain things, but then we have people that just, you know, take things for at face value. And that's, that's really dangerous. Mm. So I, you know, we, you know, as consumers of news, we have a responsibility to kind of vet certain things out, but as despite, we're all the watchdog now. You know, so as people that are also spreading information, we have to be careful that we're not spreading things that are not factual. Yeah, you hit it on the head. You hit it on the head. So I know you mentioned a quote about people having ideas. And I know it's crazy if people said if we would get faster horses and now we have all these cars and whatnot. <laughs> but let's jump in right in because you have a magazine that's really is really unique in a sense. Because like you said, most people would say, yo, why are you making a biannual magazine and magazines are going left and right? As is gone. So many magazines, Herald Sun. I know that's my local newspaper. They're they're thinking about actually, no, they've already have. They've cut out paper altogether. They're just mm-hmm. online. So you're actually going in a totally different direction. So can you share with our audience kind of what the magazine about, how it got started, and a little bit kind of just jump into that right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, it's, and it's also funny that you mentioned that just as a side note, because I, I am a teacher. But we're so our newspaper, we're the only print newspaper in the district, too. So wow. it's like I have that in that aspect. And then it's kind of like with the magazine, too. But um, the reason <clears throat> that we kind of we jumped into the magazine is because we had a blog at first, which was kind of our digital storytelling platform. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it was just it was very superficial. It was just something that we were like, OK, you know, we have to post a blog every week, you know, for it to be consistent. Um, and so it was like, you know, three lipsticks you should wear for the fall or, you know, mm. you know, celebrities and what they're wearing. And, you know, to me, that just wasn't important. Um, I felt like fashion has always been something that you should use, you know, as something to express, you know, how you feel about certain issues or, you know, how you feel about yourself or how you're feeling, you know, on a particular day. And so I wanted to do something a little bit more meaningful. So we basically kind of took, you know, some topics that we felt very strongly about and kind of synthesized them into the stories and kind of juxtapose them with editorials that also highlighted, you know, fashion and trends and, you know, things that people love to see on Instagram and whatnot, things that look pretty. But the words that we shared, um, we wanted them to mean something. And so we jumped into this project and <laughs> it was very, uh, it was very stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was just a team of us girls, three girls. Um, well, actually it was four girls and, at, we actually lost someone along the way. And so that was, you know, a big hurdle that we had to get over. So, um, but in six months we had produced this magazine and we launched it. And after the first one, we had gone through so much. We were like, man, we don't know if we want to do this again. And we literally had people telling us like, you have to, like you have to like Dallas needs something like this. Like more people need to read something like this. And so we were like, okay. So, <laughs> and I had asked, I was like, do you guys want to do this again? And they said, yeah. They said as hard as it was, they said for the first time, we actually felt like the work that we were doing meant something. Um, Cause we were actually getting out into our communities and like talking to people and sharing their stories. Man, and so. give The models that we work with an opportunity to just show like who they are. So it was just a really cool experience. And there's a lot to unpack there. Cause I, I want to backtrack a bit because yeah. that's huge. First, what when you had the idea was it you were you're all three sitting in a room the one when the one girl come to another saying you had the idea like wh- like when when was the first moment that you had the idea and then also <laughs> two yeah go ahead you and you, you actually just said like you hit the nail on the head we were actually <laughs> sitting in my bedroom my whole team and we were sitting there talking about the blog and i had all these notes and i kept saying why like all my notes had like these things like question marks like why why are we doing this why Um, and so we just started talking and one of the girls goes, we should do a magazine. And I looked at her and I was like, you're crazy. (laughs) (laughs) No, she was like, we should, let's do it. And I was like, okay. And we, and we had both had experience working for print publications before. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, and I, so I knew how much it actually took. And I was like, there's four of us, you know? Um, but she was like, let's do it. And I was like, okay. So, you know, we pulled together like all these inspiration boards and mood boards and 
color palettes and um, we just, we started making, you know, slideshows and pulling clothes and reaching out to people to about locations and we just started shooting and I started brushing up on my Photoshop and InDesign. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was a process. It was a very quick process and pretty much since we've started, we haven't stopped, which is the crazy part about it. You know, once you do something, you have to like own it. And so, Heck you know, yeah. and if you could, if you could, and, um, before we kind of get, get to the, the middle of the meat of it, I know there's a lot of people listening right now that, some are entrepreneurs, some are teachers, but I know there's a lot of people that listen to have a big idea, a big idea that they are maybe have already worked on or working on. And it's a huge idea, similar to a magazine. Like a magazine is something like you, anybody can wake up, start a website and start a blog. Anybody can wake up and sell something online or hustle or, or, or something like that. But a magazine, there's so many, and, and I want you to get into it. There's so many moving parts and that's a huge thing. So what kind of advice would you share from your experiences? Somebody has a big idea, right? But they have limited time in which they have to get it off because y'all y'all had your first magazine. Was it done in six months? Mm-hmm. So how did you tackle that? Because I'm pretty sure that you just didn't have. Or maybe I'm overstepping. You may, did you have six months alone time to do it, or were you balancing certain things? Because I really want our audience to kind of kind of be with you in that process, being a fly on the right. wall on how you were able to produce that much content and with just four people in that that small amount of time. Right. Well, and and so. And that's exactly it. People and and time are your two greatest resources that Mm -hmm. you you have to use efficiently. And, you know, you hear all these people that are like self-made millionaires and, you know, that say, you know, I I did it on my own. Um, And that's just absolutely not it. Mm -hmm. Um, You have like asking for help and having people that also believe in what you see is a really big deal. You know, it takes, you know, a, a lot of people to you know, do one thing. Like, I mean, think of people like Beyonce and like the president and, you know, people that we all like look up to and that are like icons, but there are so many people behind the scenes that make them who they are, you know? And so I feel like that's also the thing that, um, you know, we had to realize about the magazine is it was, it was going to be this really big project, but we had to ask for help. We reached out to people about, you know, letting us borrow clothes, you know, we called, you know, venues, Hey, can we, shoot in your restaurant. Um, and they like, we asked them if they could cook us, you know, a special meal for us so that we could photograph, you know, the meal. So it was, we were asking for a lot and it's not like we <laughs> had a budget. Um, I had just started teaching there. I had, we started the, the um, production for the magazine in January and I actually started teaching in January. So, uh, no, this was 2017. Wow. Yeah. January 2017, I started teaching and we started the first issue of the magazine. And so, and then, so the first issue launched at, basically we got it printed in June and we launched it in July. Um, And then literally after that one, you know, ended, we started working on the second one, which released back in February. And so, yeah. Six months. Yeah. While teaching. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I advise that people to do that, but it was, you know, it was, it was really cool because again, I am a journalism teacher. So I was in production mode at all times. And, you know, so for once in my life, you know, I I have worked a lot of different jobs and, you know, I've been in college, but for, you know, this time in my life, I really feel like I am knee deep in what I love, you know, even in my full-time job and even, you know, with, you know, what I'm doing with that. Um, That's, that's really the cool part about it. Mm. So it seems like y'all had a lot of there's two words that keep keep coming in my head when I'm thinking about this uh, focus and just that what I, what I call it I'm not going to call it grit, but it's just the ability to just keep moving forward because you have to have a lot of focus to get stuff done because yeah. I know you had to hit deadlines, right? Because I mean, in six yeah. months, because you just walk us through from a from a outsider's perspective that's not familiar with the public publishing industry. Mm-hmm. What are the real lat- literal steps to, to even making a magazine? Um, so basically what we did first is we had to come up with like with the concept, like what is the magazine going to be about? And we mm-hmm. had to look out, you know, a calendar and a timeline of how we were going to produce everything, design everything, print everything, and then distribute everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 
we, you know, synthesized all of our ideas. We kind of broke up like what kind of like sections we wanted to have in the magazine and figured out who some of our contributors could be, you know, thought of all the models we could use, you know, came up with mood boards and all this stuff. And then we started, so we started all the productions, laid those out on calendars. Um, and you have to build um, what we call call sheets. And those basically have like all the information for all the shoots, um, like where, like what, like the weather, like literally every single detail that you could possibly need for a shoot. You make one of these for every single shoot. And so that goes out to like anybody that's a part of the production. Um, and so after we do the product in, in lieu of actually us doing the productions, we're looking for people that will place ads in print magazines, mm -hmm. which is kind of hard, <laughs> you know, obviously. Um, but it can be done because there are some people that just believe in like the print industry. You know, there are some people that like, they love, you know, looking at a book online, but some people still like go to half price books and like sit in a corner and they just love to feel books. Um, and I feel like when I was younger, like I had a 17 magazine subscription. I love Teen Vogue. I used to have my mom like, you know, have me order like catalogs and stuff just so I could like cut out the clothes and everything. And so something about the print feel, you know, is, is still nostalgic to some people because it reminds them of their youth. Um, and I feel like we were kind of a generation of, you know, magazines. Um, and so we had to get people to advertise in the magazine, which was difficult. Um, but we did, um, we found some people that would place ads because we didn't want to have an adless magazine because then it just kind of looked like a storybook. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it like that. Like without ads, it's just, yeah, I feel what you're saying. <laughs> ads just, yeah, it's just kind of a book, which, which is not necessarily anything wrong with that, but we wanted, we really wanted to come out strong, like an actual, you know, legitimate publication. And so, um, so in lieu of us doing the productions, we're also looking for advertisers. Um, and then as we're completing the productions, basically, um, my pro my creative process, I always have to write things, sketch things like I, before I even touch anything digitally. Um, and that's just how I, I have always worked. Like even in high school, when I took like graphics classes, I always drew everything out first. And so, um, what I did is we laid out a page ladder and we allotted pages for all of the photo shoots and, you know, ad placements and everything. And so then what I do is like, I have my, at my house, my living room is not a living room. It's like our workspace. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of like my little lab. Um, and so after I lay out, um, all the pieces, I kind of order them and figure out how the magazine is going to flow. Um, and then I take all of those pages and I sketch out all the pages in the magazine and kind of decide how I want to design each spread. Um, and so for the first issue, there's not as many like advanced graphics, and things like that. So if you see mm -hmm. the second, issue, you can obviously see that we had more people on the team for that. And we took a little bit more risks as far as I did with the graphics and text and that kind of thing. Um, but that, and that's a process in itself, like designing over, you know, a couple dozen pages and copy editing a couple dozen pages, you know, which is kind of like the last step right before you go to printing is making sure all the color is right. Mm -hmm. Making sure there are no misspelled words, misspelled names, because once you misspell something in print, it's not like online where you can go in and fix it. It's you know, print, you have a hundred copies of a misspelled name, you know. So everything has to be perfectly edited. Um, and the color is really the hardest part. Because the way we see color um on a computer is not how you see it in print. Mm -hmm. Um so Basically, we have to we you you send off a proof and then they mail you the photos and then if the photos on paper don't look right, then you basically go back through the design process and basically fix whatever doesn't look right on paper. Um, and then you send it back, then we send you another proof, and then you go through that process again. Man, man, that's crazy. So, question: I know you mentioned it, but what type of adjustments did you make from the first and second? And then two, how did you find those people? to make those adjustments. You said the first one you were, you and just a few people were kind of editing, doing all the stuff. And then the second one seemed like there was a bigger team, a bigger groundswell support. So how did you make those adjustments? And then how did you find those, that those people to actually willing to help out? So, um, what you'll find you know, after you do something a couple, a couple of times. Um, so the first time around, it was hard to find people because, you know, we're telling people we're doing a magazine. You're like, they're like, Oh yeah, you're doing a magazine. I'm like, that's pretty ambitious, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but after the first issue, we had people reaching out to us. So yeah. that was, it was, it was much easier. People asked to be part of the design process. So I was like, uh, yes. 
Um, and so, so now even with the third issue, it's so much easier getting contributors when you can say, okay, here are two magazines that we produced. Take a look at them and let us know if you'd like to be a part of this. And so that definitely makes it easier um, as we continue to do it. But of course, like the first time around, you know, we were telling people that we're doing a magazine and <laughs> they were like, it was just kind of like <laughs> crickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, but then you do it and then it feels wonderful. And then people are like, Oh snap. And so then, you know, it kind of, it kind of helped from that. So basically for the second issue, we just, people reached out to us and we, we said yes. Um, and we worked with them on the design process. And I mean, I'm usually like pretty hands on with it. Um, so I still was, but it was, it was felt so much better to be able to like delegate certain things sometimes and, um, which can be hard to do when you're used to having your hands on so many things, but you know, after a while, so you have to kind of compartmentalize certain things so that you can be more efficient. So that was nice to be able to do the second time around. Man, that makes a lot of sense. And with that being said, how do you how did how did you stay focused on on the vision on the day to day part of the vision originally when you had no? This is the first time you're doing it, right? So it's the first time you're doing it. And sometimes, especially because I know there were situations where stuff didn't go right. People said no. People f- <laughs> fell off. And you, ha- how did you maintain your focus and your vision when it's like it, there's no proven? Because when you're in a corporate America, when you're in certain jobs and positions, you have mm-hmm. a blueprint. You have no blueprint on this magazine. You have mm-hmm. no like it, it, it. So when those times come, and this is this is this is a, a open question because I know a lot of people, even outside of business, struggle with this. Mm-hmm. Specifically, people in the creative space where there's really no define ladder and then there, there's a lot of day-to-day stuff they have to do to get there how'd you stay focused and optimistic and positive um i i i will say that one of my favorite things to be is underestimated mm-hmm. um i really thrive off and i i don't know if that's a bad thing but <laughs> i thrive <laughs> off of people telling me no mm-hmm. you know um and i've always been that way um because i just feel like we should just believe in each other a little bit more, mm-hmm. um, believe in ourselves a little bit more. Um, so, I mean, even just like getting the funding for the magazine, you know, we had ads, but at the end of the day, like we bootstrapped some funds, you know, of our own, you know, we were just like, okay, we're not eating out for a week or something, you know, but we're going to print this magazine, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, if we only order, you know, like a hundred copies or whatever. Um, we're going to, we're going to get it printed. Um, and so I think every time something bad happened, that really just kind of, you know, fueled me a little bit more to, you know, make sure that we were successful. Um, and so I really think that that's really what kind of kept me going because, you know, we had people quit and, you know, we had some people like agree to certain things and they would pull out last minute or, you know, if models cancel on you or if a shoot has to be rescheduled, like, you know, there are certain things. I think we lost a memory card for the first. Oh, magazine. my God. That's like, yeah. We had all like there. If You know, sometimes I say my life would be a reality show. I'd watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, there were so many. I just, I just said we're, we are going to keep, you know, because really at one point we were like, are we going to can we do this for real? Um, but we had to, you know, I felt like it was, we had, like, we had to show people that this is really what we believed in. And I think, um, that's just, the, that's just the fire that kept us going. Mm. With that being said, how do you, how do you measure success? I just feel like success is being exactly where you want to be with the people that you want to be with. Hmm. Um, and, and that's, that can be tough because sometimes you get one without the other, you know? But I feel like when you can perfectly align both of those um, and have exactly what you want, then that's really success. And a lot of people define those in different ways. Um, but exactly where I've always wanted to be is like telling stories and talking to people and helping people, but also being able to be creative and express myself and say, you know, whatever I want. Um, and so I feel like I've kind of I'm in that kind of space, you know, with being able to like help children and teach journalism and, you know, be part of my community and have have an actual impact on my community. But then I feel like with the magazine, I still am able to be creative and be provocative in some aspects and still like embrace my freedom of expression. And so um, 
you know, that's for me, that's success. And so um, I feel like when you can align those kinds of things, the people that you want to be with and be doing what you want to do, then that's success for me. Man, that's huge. And side note, and provocative. Like when I first read it and opened it, like I, I knew it was going to be um, – at first, when I was like fashion magazine, I was like, I don't consider myself a fashion person. When you said, "Oh, let's interview this feature," I was like, "Okay, so how are they gonna how are they gonna make this shake? Like, how does the magazine gonna look? Is it gonna be like ten pages of fashion, and you got this black guy with a suit smiling, talking about motivation?" Like, I was like, "Okay, I'm interested." But then I read it, and not only was it fashion, but the editorial piece of it, as far as telling their stories and the the diversity of content. Um, as far as LBGTQ, um, black, white, uh, people in different career paths, stories, I was blown away. So was there a model out there of a magazine or how, how were you able to capture so much culture in a, a magazine about fashion? Because that's, I, I found, I found that rather unique. Um, not necessarily. Now there are a lot of like kind of independent magazines that we look up, that we really looked up to as far as like their design and kind of like the aesthetic mm-hmm. of how they printed the publication. But as far as the content, that's why um, we felt like we had to produce a magazine like this because, you know, at my core, I'm a journalist first. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like I loved being able to put journalism on the same page as fashion, you know, and that is Kind of, that's exactly what the magazine is like it's still a piece of journalism but it's it could also sit on your coffee table you know um and i feel like the content is also evergreen in the sense that you know you can pick it up at any time of the year and the the content will still be applicable to the times you know that we're living in with that said if you were if you walked into a house and you went to a room and it was you before you started the magazine, like right, right, right now, not before you started, but right when you had the idea, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? I just really tell myself to just keep going, you know, keep going and never lose sight of what, you know, the end goal is. Um, I feel like sometimes it's really easy to get caught up in the day to day. You know, you're hustling, you're calling people, people don't call you back, people are canceling on you, you know, you're tired and you know, you're also trying to like pay your bills and be healthy and maintain relationships. And it can take a toll on you mentally and physically, you know, financially. Um, But at the end of the day, once you get to where you want it to be, it's like, that's why that, you know, that's, that's why, you know, either you, I I read something the other day is like, either you're going to feel the pain of discipline or you're going to feel the pain of regret. So Either way, it's going to hurt, you know, but at least you want it to be like a good pain, you know, Yeah. <laughs> like you want, you want to sweat for something, you know? Um, and so that's, that's exactly what I would tell myself. Mm, that's profound right there. And I know you mentioned future. What do you think is the future? Have you already started thinking about what the future is going to be continue next? I mean, I know. I don't know how big of a planner you are, but it seems like you're a huge planner. The way you plan it, methodically plan out every single page and every single thing you know, like that. So yeah. <laughs> within the next year or so, where do you kind of see it going? Well, you know, we're definitely working on the next issue currently. Mm-hmm. Um, we've actually pushed this one out a little bit further. It's going to be released in December um, because we wanted to make it bigger. We wanted to, you know, have a little bit more time to delve into a little bit more Um, and so that's currently what we're working on, but I mean, the ultimate goal has always been for us to have a platform that people can use to express themselves and to launch their careers, because we understand like what it, what it means, you know, to have to wake up early or to, you know, to have to change your living room into a studio because you need a workspace, you know, we understand that there's, you know, a need for resources for creatives to be able to, you know, build their ideas. And so that's um, ultimately um, what we want to be. A lot of times I like imagine, like picture like a a place where people can just come and like pull clothes and do photo shoots. And um, it's just, it's just, I really want us to be able to not only tell the stories we want to tell, but uh, people can also use our platform to tell theirs. So ultimately that's, 
don't know how that's going to look, but that's just what I want it to do. <laughs> gotcha. I think you're, you're taking the first step right now, just creating. Cause I mean, you can spend all day in the clouds. Okay. Plotting this unique future, mm-hmm. doing all this other stuff. But right. as you've seen since the first issue, as you continue to produce more content and people get to see it, the vision will come to you and it'll, it'll manifest. Mm-hmm. So I definitely um, can agree a wholeheartedly with that. Absolutely. And I mean, again, like this is not even something that we had ever planned to do it was kind of like, again, we were sitting in my room and we we're like, let's do this. <laughs> and people were like, yeah, you have to keep doing it. And we we're like, okay, kind of. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I really want to see, you know, where this will continue to take us. So where does the NBA, because as you um, as you as you mentioned off the podcast, you are about to enter a NBA program to get your business mm-hmm. degree. So master's in business. Uh, where does that fit in? Because you usually don't see journalism people that are having a, a full blown magazine and are teaching and then they decide to go get a, a MBA. So where did that come into play and how did that uh, how did that come to fruition? Um, I feel like I've, I have. I'm a person that has a lot of different ideas, but I've also wanted to be able to use my success and help others. Um, and so my, basically my, the, my focus will be strategy and entrepreneurship. Um, and so I, I, I want to not only make my business thrive, but I would also like to know how to invest in other businesses and, you know, help them be successful as well. Um, and I just also, um, you know, eventually I want to have a family and I want to be able to have things to give my children and to, you know, pass on, you know, for generations for them to be able to, you know, invest and also have options with their future. So I try to think really long term with a lot of the moves that I make. And so that's kind of why I decided to make that move. So and and, and that's huge. And also, too. <laughs> What have you? What would you say? Because right now you're you're currently a teacher. How do you think that has added? What would you say you've been learning from this experience, and how it's been adding and helping you, and actually your business endeavor as well? Um. Well, definitely seeing the next generation of thinkers is is just very interesting. Um, the way that teenagers, you know, think now because of the phenomenon that is the internet. Yeah. Um, it is absolutely just incredible. So, and so just to put this into perspective, like, so you can understand how young my students are. Um, I was talking to them, we were going over the history of broadcast. And so we went over significant TV, um, or TV events that were covered, had significant coverage on TV. <laughs> um, and so one of them was like the JFK assassination. And, you know, some of them had, they knew, they knew about it, but they didn't really know a lot of the facts. Um, and then we talked about 9-11 and so all of my students, uh, for them, 9-11 is actually now officially history because none of them were born Mm. when 9-11 happened. And so, um, they don't, they didn't, they don't even really know, you know, what happened. They know kind of some details, but for them, it's just like, oh, there were some buildings that collapsed in New York. Like, I kid you not. I gave a final exam and several of them like wrote that, you know, like they, and so, you know, just to, you know, kind of see how their minds work, you know, they, they just don't work this. And it's, it's not really a huge age difference between myself and my students. I'm 24. And so the, my oldest students are like 17, 18. So it's about a six year difference uh, at the most, maybe 10. But still, because I really do feel like because of the Internet, they have access to so much information. But because they have so much access to information, they don't necessarily know what's right and what's wrong, you know, and they're just constantly seeing things that, you know, can't necessarily be perceived as reality. You know, they might be like idolizing the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Just just seeing the next generation of thinkers is interesting, but it has also helped me you know, with modeling my business, like, okay, so this is how the next generation is going to work. So I should kind of, you know, kind of forecast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I will say it's interesting just connecting with them. I mean, they're hilarious. Oh yeah. I have a ton of fun with them and I feel like because I teach journalism, you know, I can talk to them about real things. Um, and just kind of give you an idea of what my students look like. Majority of my students are Hispanic. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so, as you can imagine, with the current presidency and mm-hmm. several of the things that are happening with immigration policies and, you know, what's being covered in the media, um, a lot of times our I used our lessons to talk about those things because I actually have children, you know, in my room that are scared and families that are scared. Um, so it was just it's just very it can be rewarding, but it can also be tough sometimes. But I, it's also, you know, like I said, it's cool to be able to connect with them about real life issues. Yeah, that's huge. And with that being said, how do you do you ever get this is a better question, because sometimes I know I get a lot of people uh, that come on the show and they're like, man, I got this full time job. But I know if I could if I have more time, I'll be able to do X, Y and Z. I can't <laughs> wait to do X, Y and Z. Do you ever get discouraged? Not discouraged. I don't know if that's the right word, but do you ever think, man, if I had, if I could just devote my, my full time experience and focus to, to my magazine, things would be different? Or do you like having that, 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 that constant, um, push with the students and just that real life experience with the students and then being able to after school focus on the magazine? Right. Um, I, so, I mean, long term with me going to school and everything, I would like to eventually, I I still want to be teaching, but I would probably like to be a professor long term. And I would like to be able to kind of, you know, use my influence as someone with experience in, you know, business and in fashion to be able to kind of impart that knowledge to students at the university level, um, and kind of help them, you know, hone in on their ideas and their skills. Um, because fashion and business is a huge industry, but I don't feel like it's there are a lot of like academic resources for students. Because a lot of times you hear people starting these ideas like after college or, you know, like for me, it was kind of like my senior year of college. But um, to be able to have someone like kind of give you a model for how to do that without like going broke or, you know, having to like freelance or whatever for so long. Um, I think I would eventually like to be able to do that, but at, you know, at the, at my core, like I said, journalism is what I love. So I'll always be writing in some aspect. I'll always be like in production and I'll always be in education. Um, but I feel like I'm just going to have to try to align those a little bit more so that they kind of work more hand in hand. Yeah. And that's ambitious because I know so many friends that unfortunately right after school, the ones that had a fashion and were in journalism, specifically fashion, but definitely journalism mm-hmm. as well. I mean, mm-hmm. the opportunities were unpaid internships mm-hmm. or 20 hours a week here or working at a photo studio. And it's like, right. I'm talking about, in my opinion, even though I may not have the best eye for fashion, but I'm talking about genius level design talent, genius level or they, they could have cultivated and, and worked in the craft to become genius level. And soon they became disillusioned after a couple of years. Not all of them, but a lot of them did. Right. And then they stopped writing or they stopped being in fashion and et cetera. And it's like, man, is that the only way in the industry? Like is business yeah. and uh, engineering the only time where you can come out and really make manageable money? There has to be another right. way. Right. And, and I, and I definitely agree. And, and I, and I, like I, I, I really feel like I was very lucky with the professors that I had and we had a fashion media program. Um, and even in the fashion media program, work very closely with the business school and with the journalism school. Um, like I took a business journalism school, but because a, a class and because the professor knew I was in the fashion media program, the company that he gave me to profile for the semester was a fashion company. So I feel like they were very accommodating of us wanting to concentrate on that and wanted to really give us like real tools, real resources, real skills, you know, to be able to do you know, what we wanted to do. And so um, I do feel like I was in the, in the perfect kind of space and I had the right kind of support to not be afraid to just kind of take the risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do feel like I, I was very lucky in that aspect. And speaking of support and space, I know we didn't have our chance, but we usually always make sure that we ground our audience of kind of who our listener, I mean, who our guest comes from and and, and all that. So can you share with the audience like a little bit about your background and, and where you come from and who you are before the magazine and everything else? <laughs> um, so uh, born and raised in Dallas, Texas, actually kind of Garland, Texas. Um, I say that because my boyfriend, he's from Dallas and he's like, I hate people say they're from Dallas and they're not actually from Dallas. So I'm from Garland. It's a little kind of suburb, like, you know, 20 minutes. But it's in Dallas though, right? Like, the now, people- <laughs> not, I mean, I guess. Love for fashion come from? Like, did you just, did you always, was it, was it love for fashion or journalism? Which one came first? Or is it like I, a mix? You know, I don't know. You know, I told you, so when I was younger, I used to, 
order these like cows. You go online and mm-hmm. like if if an if a online store had a catalog, you need to get them sent to your house for free. So my mom was like not gonna pay for me to have a bunch of magazine subscriptions. So I would just order catalogs and I would cut out these clothes and I would tape and glue them into this little sketch pad that I had. And I would take little arrows and draw little boxes and I would like um you know say like okay i want i want to find some pants that look like this and i want to you know find a shirt that looks like this and even like in high school i was voted best dressed senior year and that's like my proudest award ever <laughs> <laughs> i you know and it's not because i it's not about it's not about like just me just loving to shop it's just that i love seeing like you look at a shirt by itself and it's like okay but then it's like you see what someone does with that shirt how it's just a piece of a bigger puzzle you know and it's like you can use your fashion to say so much you know you think about you know people were all black you know for mourning or all black you know like black panthers were all black or you know uh you know there's a certain attire for certain things like fashion is is really important and infiltrates so many aspects of our lives and i think you can use it to talk about politics and you can use it to talk about diversity and sex. And there's just so many different ways to interpret it. And, and that's what I love about it. And I think that's what I also love about journalism is I'm not confined to one thing. I'm just out getting a story and talking to people and connecting with people. And so it allows me to, you know, be open to so many different things and so many different people. And, and I think, so I think they really just kind of go hand in hand. I don't know if I really fell in love with one first I think they kind of just married each other and I like fell into the, you know, <laughs> the love child. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I think that's how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> man, man, man. As we, as we're getting closer to an end, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask, I always try to ask my, my guest about, a, about the future. And, um, when it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? Well, and I hate to get morbid so fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to be remembered as someone who genuinely cared about people. Um, you know, I, you know, there's so much bad that's going on, you know, in the world. And anytime, like I have a little alarm that goes on my phone every day and it asks me, you know, what positive impact have you made today? If you haven't done anything. Oh, wow. Is it like a, so- a, a, a reminder? Yeah, it goes off my phone every day because... Sometimes I know I get caught up in doing certain things and I'm like, okay, what did I do for somebody else today? You know, how, how was I, did I smile at somebody? You know, did I help somebody, you know, did I, you know, grab somebody's card that fell on the ground or something? What, what did I do that, you know, just could have made a difference in somebody's life today? And, you know, it doesn't even have to be that large. And I've tried to really help myself, you know, to think more locally because sometimes that's where, you know, problems start. And so I just really want to be remembered as somebody that genuinely cared and that touched as many people, you know, as possible. Mm. Wow. That's profound, man. And what would you say, what would you say your goals are for the summer? Because I know you got like six weeks in between. Is it just full on a <laughs> magazine? Are you just studying? Like what, what are you going to do for the summer? Uh, my summer, I feel like it is already over because I've literally <laughs> planned like every day. Um, but we have, so we're going to California next week. We're doing some photo shoots in California, which I'm really excited about. And, um, I'm working on an MBA math course. Yay me. Um, and I'm lesson planning and I'm, I'm going to try to take a little bit of me time, you know, and, you know, I, I went to go see my dad and I've been trying to, you know, make sure I, you know, get connected with my family. I have a little bit of free time, but, um, for the most part, I'm going to keep hustling and right on down to, August when the kids clock back in with me. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our last question before we jump to our uh, rapid fire culture change round. Yes. This whole interview, you have mentioned planning nonstop, and it seems that you are like have a PhD in planning. For, <laughs> for, for a lot of people out there that struggle with planning or struggle with doing that, is there any books, resources, or mindsets that that that, that have allowed you to be such a great planner? Um, you know. I don't, I would just say what works for me per se, but, um, I've really had to get in sync, like with my team, we keep everything logged into, you know, our Google calendars synced up. Um, and I write everything down. I have multiple calendars. I have a dry erase calendar in my room. I have like my physical calendar, like my book that I keep in my bag. And then I have my calendar like on my phone and on my computer. 
And sometimes there's a, a, you know, a repeat of everything, but I feel like for you to reach your goals, you have to have them in front of you at all times in some way. Um, and so for me to make sure that I'm always keeping my eyes on the prize and not forgetting about anything or anybody, um, I just always make sure it's documented somewhere. Um, and so there, I mean, and there are like apps that you can use, but you know, the best thing is to just figure out what's best for you. Like I said, I love to write everything down. So I have like my actual planner that I write everything in, but you know, I also have to make sure I'm communicating with my team. So it's best to know yourself and to cover your bases and to just keep, you know, what's important in front of you at all times. Mm. Said, say no more. Say no more. That was perfect. And it's like, yeah, you're only 24 years old. Like, shoot, I can't wait to see in five, 10 years if that kind of <laughs> diligence. I didn't, I, I didn't really get hip to the planning board till I was like 26, 27. I mean, I, I plan, but it's different between planning and then planning with intention and, and realizing priorities. Right. Because but a lot you know, teaching will do that to your life. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so our, <laughs> yes, it will. Our culture change round was five. I asked five rapid fire questions. You give me five. Uh, if you can, rapid fire answers. You ready? All right. Okay. <laughs> What's the Let's best go. piece of advice that you have never received? I have never received. Ooh. Uh, don't go out with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just going to leave that there. I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> uh, that's a new quote right there. I'm a, I got a daily daily text quote. I might I might have to add that in there. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> if you could add if you could add one habit and take away one habit, what would they be? Um. So our my takeaway habit would be Netflix, and that's like a new habit. Um, but take I definitely a new. Take how is Netflix a new habit? Because I, you know, I've, I've never been a binge watcher or a TV person. My parents don't really have TV in my room, but I like Netflix. Just has these good shows, and it's like I finish one and then I find another. And ugh. so <laughs> that's a hat. And I'm like, before I know it, I've watched like three episodes, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so definitely that would be a habit that I wish I could take away. Um, and then what did you say? A habit that I that you could add that I could add. Ooh, um, working out. Yeah. Um, it's very inconsistent. Um, I try to like, you know, do like a little something every day, but sometimes I like, I have a gym membership and everything and I can't tell you, I probably went like last month. <laughs> what the planner, how the planner of planners of planners go on, like working out is all about just planning and executing or just find somebody else yeah. to hold you like, accountable. You know, I, but that even though I like I said I haven't I've been haven't been to the gym since last month I have worked out uh-huh. but I just I'm just not as disciplined as I once was so but it is something I'm working on this summer so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be looking for an article about that in the next uh, magazine. You can be like a full <laughs> spread. It can be I don't know how you can arti- art I might make a word articulize that but uh, <laughs> if you can I, I'm, I'm looking forward to your your tra- not transformation that's that's drastic <laughs> but uh, that's drastic. But uh, updates on that. Yeah, my, well, name my transformation mindset. Yeah, I need to be a little bit more disciplined. <laughs> uh, what is your biggest fear? Oh, dude. Um, I don't want to be so morbid, but like my biggest fear is me dying before accomplishing everything that I wanted to do. But hmm. that is probably my biggest fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I always like, you know, like live like there's no tomorrow. Like I really try to, you know, this life can be really short. And so I just always am trying to like cease the day. So that, I, yeah, that kind of got dark for a second, but that's, you know, really kind of, you know, you want to leave a good legacy. Yeah. 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 And time is, and I'm telling you, once you get 25, I'm telling you, time just starts like just running. Just just <laughs> <I know. laughs> like days, just, I tell everybody days used to be forever when you're growing up, like high school. I mean, middle school. I was like, yo, the day would never end. It would never be three o'clock. It's always 1140. I'm like, bro, there's always 15 minutes before lunch. I don't get it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I read, I read this book called The Happiness Project. And one of the things she said was, as you get older, the days are long, but the years are short. And so, you know, it's one of those things, time kind of starts to change, feel a little bit different once you get older, but, you know, you don't want to let a year go by and be like, dang, I didn't even, you know, do such and such. So. And I think that's probably more tune. And I think you slowly hit on it um, with the children, children, the students is it like, the I think it's a mindset thing. It has to be a mindset thing. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the last question the coach changed round is if you were the president of the United States, what's the first thing you would do? Um, make Juneteenth the national holiday. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes. That would be appropriate since it's today. <laughs> yeah, because we got if, it, if Independence Day is a national holiday, then Juneteenth got to be a holiday. Yep. I, I actually read something today that said it is uh, state recognized or uh, observed in forty five states. I call everybody a culture change agent that calls, comes on this show, and I, you definitely fit the build. And this last question, this is outside of the rapid fire, but this last question I, is is an important question I've asked every single person of the 80 going on 90 people that's been on this show over the last three years, this question. And if you could change one thing about society, most specifically our African-American culture, what would it be and why? Um, I would just, I mean, I guess as a people, I would just want us to make sure that we protect each other and, you know, that we keep our minds open, you know, to change but then also for everyone else, you know, the same thing to protect each other and to keep, you know, our, their minds open, you know, to people that are different from them. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially like we have grandparents sometimes that have certain views and, you know, it's like as we start to get older, stuff like that, you know, but then, out, you know, outside of the community, we also have the same thing, you know. There are people whose, you know, families might believe a certain way or have certain, you know, views or racist views, you know, and their children are starting to see like, hey, that's, you know, that's you can't say stuff like that. Like, that's that's wrong. Um, and so I feel like those are kind of some of the things that we need to change on both sides. We need to be more open and we need to protect each other because at the end of the day, we all bleed red. So um, I think it's just important for us to recognize the humanity in everybody. You know, regardless of whatever differences we have, you know, at the end of the day, life is life. So I think we just need to kind of recognize that a little bit more about each other. I think with the Internet, we can kind of dehumanize certain people because we can't see them or feel them. But, you know, in reality, it's real. Like everybody has feelings and everybody has somebody that cares about them. So I just think we need we need more of that. Couldn't have said it better myself. That's a phenomenal way to close out the interview. Um, before we depart, can you share with our audience uh, social media handles where we can find more information at and also, too, how we can support the magazine? Absolutely. Um, so our website is Fash in Forward. So it's Fash, the letter in forward dot com. Um, and you can follow us um, at Fash dot in on Instagram. Um, you can follow me at Micah in the making on Instagram um, and everything else. Same thing as well. Um, and yes, if you go to the website, you can check out the magazine. We also have a blog on there that we post on every Thursday, which is just really kind of a place where we kind of just freely express ourselves. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's, you know, you know, emotional, but it's just kind of a really cool platform that we kind of give our followers a little taste of what we do every week. So um, check us out. We're pretty, we're pretty cool. We're pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> So Minority Trouble as a Nation, make sure you know that everything that's been mentioned is going to be in the show notes and the links. Um, on behalf of myself and on behalf of Minority Trouble as a Nation, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving us over or at an hour of your time. Because I know you could be doing anything in the world, but you were here with us. So I say thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Greg. It's been great. No doubt, no doubt. So Minority Trouble as a Nation, make sure you do two things and two things only. One, make sure you leave a review. And subscribe to the channel. Tell a friend to tell a friend. And two, make sure you're changing the freaking culture. Good night.